Welcome, I'm Charlie Rose and this is Inside the Advocate. Today we're talking with Leo Roth, a uh, respected medical malpractice attorney from uh, the Washington DC area and we're going to sort of pick his brain, see if we can learn some lessons from him uh, that he's accrued over the course of his time uh, as a medical malpractice attorney. Leo, why don't you just introduce yourself, let everybody know, you know where you're from, what you're about. Okay, I was born and raised in Washington DC. After graduating Wake Forest, uh, I attended American University Law School at night in 1964. Uh, in those days, uh, you could still go to night school and, and uh, complete the uh, studies three years at night. And so I did that, including Saturdays and summers, for um, three years and um, got my JD from American University in 67. The end of 67, I sat for the bars in the state of Maryland and the District of Columbia within the same month. Started practicing in both jurisdictions in the spring of 1968. So you've been practicing law now for 48 years? 48 years now, yes. 48 years. So you've seen the profession just transform itself? Absolutely. Now, before we get into that, I've got to point something out to the audience because it's sort of a cool fact about you that that people wouldn't know if I didn't bring it up. You said that you were at Wake Forest. Yes. Now, I happen to be a, a Chicago Bears football fan, and I understand that, that you were at Wake Forest with, with one of the guys who subsequently played for the Bears. Brian Piccolo, yes. Now, this is the Brian Piccolo from the Piccolo Award yes. that they give out each year? Exactly, yes. You know, uh, was he uh, senior to you, junior to you in school? Brian was a year behind me, and uh, I met Brian in the gymnasium when he was a freshman because I had a, a – um, Jersey and it said Piccolo on it, which was a bar restaurant in D.C. which I played summer uh, summer league basketball. And he came up and said, "I really like that shirt." And I said, "Well, thanks." He said, "I'd like to buy it." And I said, "No." And he said, "My name is Brian Piccolo," and I knew who he was, but that's the first time I met him. And we developed a friendship. And then we used to go to church on Sundays. We we're both Catholic, and we started a Bishop Newman Club uh, at Wake Forest for the first time. And was he the kind of guy that? you hoped he might be just from watching the movie and the like. Was that, was that valid? Absolutely valid. He, he, was, he was a terrific running back, that's for sure. He was a grinder, if you will, in football. He was mm -hmm. small. He led the uh, Division I football yardage gains in his senior year. Uh, he did not get picked up by any of the pros, but um, just with perseverance, he got a walk-on, basically, with the Bears and then started with Gerald Sayers in the same backfield. Yeah, and I, he had a great humor too. Great did humor. he really? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Thinking about that experience uh, as college athletics, being in the South in the '60s, uh, um, as a as a Catholic student at a at a Baptist school, uh, what kind of lessons did you pull from that that you then brought into your practice of law when you got uh, admitted to the bar? Well, I, I think. It was a very small school, uh, 1,400 undergrad class. Um, the lessons I learned, actually learned how to study. Um, for the first time in the educational thing, you're on your own. It's up to you. You don't have anybody pushing you or not pushing you. You have to learn to do it yourself. You're terrified that first six months, like everyone else, I think, that went to college. Um, learning how to properly prepare for whatever lessons you have within the, in the uh, school system. Help prepare for law school. Uh, uh, and to me, uh, I worked during the day and went to law school at night. So it, there was no more real camaraderie other than, you know, you know the people you're playing with. But you just learn how to buckle down and do what you're supposed to do, basically. Now, when you went, uh, when you sat for the bar and you passed the bar, you had a lot of different career options that you could have picked, right? Yes. Where Where did you go? What did you wind up doing? I, I wound up going into a trial firm in D.C., a boutique trial firm. There was around eight or nine, and it would merge up to around 14 or 15 during my tenure with them. Uh, and it was a civil trial firm. Uh, I worked at the courthouse. Uh, stepping back a little bit, in 1959 when I graduated from high school, I did not go to college. Um, I was only 17. I was a year ahead of my age group. Uh, so uh, I didn't go to college. 
uh, and I worked at the domestic relations branch in the courthouse filing, filing papers. Uh, and then I, I took some law, took some uh, brief classes at George Washington University to prepare for the college boards. And then I went the, the next year. Uh, so you kind of fell into it from from your work experience? From a work experience. So when I graduated from college, I knew the court personnel. Mm -hmm. uh, so I felt working at the courthouse would be a good mix with law school. Um, I didn't intend to be a trial lawyer then. I always wanted to be a lawyer. My dad was a lawyer. My older brother is a lawyer. Um, so um, when I went to American University, I worked at the courthouse. And I worked in the courtrooms with the judge. I was a bailiff to a judge. Uh, and I did that my entire career uh, of law school for three to four years. So you're a law student working in the court system. You know everybody. Right. That had to help when you were looking for a job. Absolutely. When, when I looked for a job, they had 17 judges in the municipal court, it was called in D.C. I knew every one of them by my first name. Their first name. They called me Leo. Because uh, when my judge was sick, I would substitute for them. I also ran the pretrial section. Uh, I also ran half of some of the assignments, civil assignment. So I got to know all the civil lawyers. So the best of the best in those times, which was 48 years ago, uh, when all these young lawyers who became very, very successful uh, uh, in the District of Columbia area and some national like Jake Stein, and people like that, they were there. And these are the people I met. And in those days, uh, defense lawyers, insurance defense lawyers, what they're called then, uh, defense lawyers were making more income than plaintiff's lawyers. The, the plaintiff's cases were not creating the verdicts yet in, <clears throat> in the mid-1960s. Most of it was automobile work, a little bit of slip and fall type cases. Uh, the fertility of the medical malpractice case and the products liability case had not matured yet. Okay. And so... Um, I chose the defense firm from the lawyers that I met, who were the partners in the firm that were down there almost every day trying lawsuits. Law now, as a bailiff sitting in that, that courthouse with the, with the judge and seeing these cases uh, make their way through the process, you must have had a lot of opportunity to watch a lot of lawyers. Oh, every day. Every day. You, so you're, you're watching lawyers every day and then going to law school at night. Yes. yes. How did that impact you know, your approach to legal education when you were studying? Did you, did you think of it differently because you were seeing the, the sausage actually being made this day? Well, it, it made case, the cases like evidence mm -hmm. uh, and then um, some of the trial advocacy that was just beginning in those days. It made those cases easier for me. Um, I, I knew all the U.S. Uh, attorneys assigned to the municipal court. Uh, when I had to perform my trial for advocacy uh, at American University, I borrowed the U.S. Attorney's trial handbook, <laughs> the trial handbook. And used their handbook? You used their handbook in, in the court at American University, and I had my roommate from college uh, come and be a witness for me. And so, you know, they give you a little bit, of course, you know, but you have a little leverage, you can, you know, tweak the facts a little bit the way mm -hmm. you are. And the judge was a, um, a practicing criminal defense lawyer who I knew from the courthouse. And so he called us to the bench during the middle of the trial because I was doing very well, because I, I was much more comfortable. I knew the arena more so yeah. than, than my opponent. And he says, this is off the record. This isn't fair. <laughs> you know, it was that type of thing. Isn't there something that happens when you when you're so comfortable in the space that you're in, that the fear doesn't get in the way and you can do the job. Absolutely. And it, where do you think that comfort came from from you? When I started practicing law in the District of Columbia, the, you, the municipal court, or general sessions it turned into, had a jurisdiction for personal injury up to 3,500. Then you would go to the federal court if it was more than that, even though you didn't have diversity of citizenship. The, the federal court acted in, and still does over 100,000 now. In so, D.C., so it's much easier to get into, into yeah, federal court. You don't need the actual same. Uh, you don't need the subject matter jurisdiction. Subject. You, don't, you don't have that fight because you're in the District of That's Columbia. That's correct. That's correct. 
So when I went before those judges, you always tried to settle them, and it was always Leo, and then it was Mr. So-and-so. Mm -hmm. It was that type of environment, and I felt comfortable in it. I, I knew where I should position myself in the, the court, except, <laughs> except there's, there's a great example that I, from teaching all of the young associates for my career with the mm -hmm. law firm I'm no longer with, but uh, I think it was my first trial. And it was a hard trial. It was an automobile case. And so I'm getting excited in my argument, and I'm getting closer and closer to the jury. And there's only one person really nodding his head and looking at it. So I figure, well, maybe I can get a mistrial because I know I'm going downhill on the liability. So I'm looking at him, and I'm getting so excited, and some spit came out of my mouth and hit him right in the forehead, and he just stared at me then. His head stopped going up and down like that. And I said, and I backed away. You've lost the one juror that you had. Yeah, and so when the jury went out to deliberate, Judge Corman, uh, who used to be the corporation counsel then a judge, he passed a note to the bailiff and said yeah, he wanted to see Leo in Chambers. So I come back there and he goes, Leo, don't get so close. Number one, you're in vain in space. Number two, I saw you spit on him. So you spit on the juror. Yeah. I well, mean, at least he didn't call you out in open court. Right. And know. offer the juror a handkerchief. Yeah, exactly. But it was that type of relationship I had with, um, with the judges in the Superior Court. And then in the federal court, I, I knew some of those judges who had been practicing, you know, this is three or four years sure. later, and got appointed by the president to go to the federal court. So uh, I always felt comfortable uh, in, you know, I, I'm nervous like everybody else. What was your experience with lawyers mentoring other lawyers back then? I mean, what was the, what was the environment like? Uh, I, I, was, I was lucky because uh, I chose this particular defense firm because of two lawyers, uh, Denver Graham and Larry Scott. Uh, Why'd you pick them? Because I watched them in trial. Okay. And so I be kind of became friends with them when I would work down in the assignment office mm -hmm. and, you know, just became friends with them and I saw them in trial. And I can't really say why I knew that they were better than the other people, but, but uh, then when I went to the firm, I kind of, became, uh, Denver Graham mentored me more than any of the other lawyers in the firm. Now, most lawyers have a moment in their career where they realize that they've either reached another level or a light bulb comes on, and it's, it's often it happens in conjunction with something that you did or a case that you tried or an event that happened where you realize I'm not the same lawyer I was before or where you go, this is my path, this is what I'm going to do, this is what matters to me. Did you ever have a moment like that? I didn't have that epiphany type mom moment. I kind of, I knew I was going to a different level when I started uh, trying the medical malpractice cases. How did you get into that? Um, I started in 68 and in 1968 uh, in most of the states and in the, at the federal level they were thinking of automobile, motor vehicle, accident, tort reform. Mm -hmm. and so they've been talking about tort reform for the last 50 years is what oh, you're yeah, telling me. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and the verdicts uh, in medical malpractice uh, were few and far between in those days for, for several reasons. I don't know if you want me to go into that. But, yeah, go ahead. Uh, the, the first reason was the locality rule, mm -hmm. uh, which most jurisdictions had, that you could not testify against another doctor unless you practice medicine in that field, in that locality. Now, wait a minute. Back, back this up here. So what you're telling us is that in order to get a doctor to testify about medical injuries, you had to get someone from the same community. Yes, you had to get someone from Manatee County to testify against a doctor in Manatee County. Well, they're not going to do that because they're all part of the same, it, it's, they're the same community. Exactly. It was, it was, it was uh, uh, favored for the defendant, absolutely. Well, how did, when did that change and how did it change? The, the explosion of um, the uh, various specialties was one reason. The Court of Appeals, because all of this is based upon, com all of medical malpractice is common law. Yep. We got it not from England, we got it from uh, 
years before the birth of Christ, where uh, the first medical malpractice cases anybody has uh, historically um, given us some information about, uh, it came when someone tried to fix, a guy got lanced and he tried to fix his thing with a, uh, a lance, you know, burning mm -hmm. lance, and he also took something off someone's eye, an abscess of the eye. One guy lost the eye, the other guy died, so they chopped off both his hands. Now, th that's the first medical malpractice case, okay. Moving up to the 60s, uh, the, uh, and so doctors behaved themselves, so to speak. But moving up to the 60s, the courts of appeals started to say, well, well this really isn't, this really doesn't make any sense. And what was it an equity or a fairness issue, or was it a, no, an access to justice? Why were they looking at it? They were looking at it because the plaintiff bar were trying to um, uh, reverse the locality rule because it didn't. It wasn't fair. Number one, because no one's going to testify to someone else, and and number two, if you have an orthopedic surgeon in 1972 who practices in Manatee County, Florida. He's under the same standard as someone that practices in New York City. So it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. He's not, he's not bound by it. Ergo, you are not bound by having an expert from that jurisdiction. So the locality rule was, was not really based in a, in a rational argument for the need for it. It was a, it was a protectionism rule. It was a protection. Pure and simple. It, in my opinion, yes, it was. Uh, and in, I think it's interesting that, you know, particularly for the young lawyers who'll be watching this, that that the same type of battles that you see between the plaintiff's bar and the defense bar politically uh, now, these, these have been going on ever since there have been a plaintiff's bar and a civil defense bar. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, it, and it's, my guess is it kind of ebbs and flows over the course of a career. You see things change. Yeah, and how far will the pendulum shift? Uh, um, like all of the tort reform and medical malpractice or other personal injury cases where they have a cap, that's, that's tort reform by code. Uh, it's not common law. It doesn't come from cases from the Court of Appeals. Um, so like Maryland has a cap. The District of Columbia has no cap. Well, you haven't practiced in places that have caps and don't have caps. What do you see, you know, I mean, really, what are, what are really the impacts of a cap? on medical malpractice claims? What does, it, what does it do to the process? It depends upon the amount of the cap, uh, and it depends upon whether the jurisdiction allows future, medi uh, future loss of income, mm -hmm. uh, and I think all jurisdictions allow future loss of wage, uh, discounted to present worth. But um, if you're in a jurisdiction that has a small cap, say $200,000, $250,000, uh, and they don't allow future um, loss of future medicals or whatever, future loss of income from the job, uh, and you're in a medical malpractice case, and this, this comes in the initial thing of, am I going to take this case or not? Sure. And it stays with you the whole case. You continually have to reevaluate that if you're a plaintiff's attorney. Uh, and I did plaintiff's work as well as defense work, medical mal and all those things. But uh, here's, what, here's what I'm trying to say. If the case is worth $250,000 and you need multiple experts and your maximum is going to be $250,000 and you're going to spend between $75,000 and $100,000 in getting these experts and all the depositions and all the court costs and everything else, uh, what is the sense of that? doesn't make any economic sense to the practitioner because medical malpractice cases are enormous in time and resources. You spend more time on that than the other type of negligence cases that we do. Uh, it's similar to a products liability case. What do you, what's your response to the argument that, um, that not having a cap is one of the reasons that we have uh, health insurance cost overruns? in the United States today. Do you buy that argument? I think there is a relationship. Uh, you know, I, I can't say statistically what it is, but I, th I think it's a two-prong reason why I say that. Mm -hmm. uh, the cost of medical insurance for doctors, the last I saw was something like 
six billion dollars a year. Six billion in the United States for doctors. Well, you're not even getting remotely that sort of claims against doctors. No, but they're spending that money. So that's going to be sent to the client, too. Someone's got to pay for all of that. In other words, if, if the medical malpractice for OBGYNs in D.C. 10 years ago was like $130,000, $135,000 a year. So you start the year on January 1. $135,000. In the hole. In the and, hole. and then you do, your rent is going up. Your insurance payments are cutting back. You, and you're not getting the money from the patient. So your income is going down. Your overhead is going up. So uh, I, I think there's a lot to that. But isn't the insurance company making money on both ends? They make money off the premiums from the doctor, and they have big payouts occasionally. But the payouts that they have are never going to approach the amount that they're that they're pulling in in premiums. They're still in the business. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, true tort reform would would remove the need for the insurance company at a certain level. Yeah, but it would have to impact on the right for the injured person to recover fully. Let's talk about that. The, <clears throat> where do you see the right to jury trial in a civil setting in the United States in your area now? What do you think? What, what do you think that is, from the standpoint of uh, true access to the courts for, for med mal cases? Uh, is it under attack? Is it fine? Is it somewhere in between? What do you no, think? No, I, I, in D.C. and Maryland, I, I, I think it's there. It's, uh, it exists. It, it exists. I haven't heard any legislation talk or anything of that nature that they're going to try and change that. They'd have to change that with the right to a jury trial. And the so how long have you been trying med mal cases? My first med mal case, I think, was like in 1971, 72. So 40 plus years. Yes. Have they changed systemically in that, in that 40 years of time? Only to the point that there's now a cap in Maryland. Uh, in D.C., there's no tort reform other than you have to give a 90-day notice uh, so the defendant has the right to look at what they have and maybe make a settlement and that type of thing. So, so what about the process that you go through when you get a case and you take a case? Um, help me understand what you're thinking as the client comes in the door. Well, of course, you're going to listen to the client's factual base. Okay. You take that. Uh, the majority of times, they just have one or two little pieces of medical, and uh, so you're going to hear their side of the story. Um, and you can get, you know, a sense of, should I take this further? I mean, if it's just beyond the pale type thing, then you just say, you know, you should go to somebody else. Maybe you find, you know, there's a lot of other lawyers. I can't take it. But the first thing you do is just sever out the facts. And to do that, you have to get all the medical for this particular treatment. And then I like to go back five, maybe more years to what their medical history was. Mm -hmm. No matter what it was, I, I want to find it. Some of it might be private and unrelated. Um, and the, the way I've always handled it, and I don't know about other lawyers, but if, if I uh, have them sign a retainer the first day, my retainer explains that I'm going to get all the medical records, make an analysis, and then I'll give them opinion uh, to so, go forward. So you've got a scope of representation from the very beginning. Right. You're identifying the steps that you're going to take on behalf of the client, yep. and then you're you're also giving them a, a, a point at which an additional decision is going to have to be made. Right. And they know all of this when, when they first sit down and decide to hire you. Yes. yes. Now, over the course of, you know, you know, 40 plus years of practice, has that sort of approach with that initial client get together, has it worked well? Yes, it has worked well for me. Okay, what, um, was that something that folks just, you just sort of learned it by osmosis being in the law firm? Was it what well, your mentor did or? I, you know, since I was from a defense firm mm -hmm. um, and in the firm I, I did I would say probably 20% plaintiff's work over the years and 80% defense work. Um, so, but, but I had a great respect for the medical profession, I, I, and I still do. So I wanted to, and what I personally did in those days, since 
we all had our own corral of experts in various specialties that we could call on the phone and say, let me run this by you. You're not going to be involved. Sure. But am I heading in the right direction? Uh, you know, you call a neurosurgeon and say, I don't want to take it further unless I know. And so give me the real truth. And so I would get a more than a curbstone opinion, but I would get a good opinion from an expert that I trusted and is going to tell me the truth and not lead me down a path who I wasn't going to use. Um, so they don't have any financial incentive they have to, no to sell you. Exactly. And they wouldn't want to get into, uh, for the old locality rule, but the, the mindset mm -hmm. of uh, they're not going to testify against another neurosurgeon in D.C. if you're from D.C. They're, they they're, still, not they're still not going to do that. They're still not going to do that. They're still not going to do that. Uh, and, and I really don't blame them for business reasons and, and everything. Same else. thing with med medical malpractice for lawyers. I mean, you don't want to. Exactly. You don't want to be the lawyer that opines on the other lawyers. Exactly. Unless right. you're a law professor, and then you don't care. Right. Um, <laughs> well, you don't care at the same level, right? Because yeah. you're really not part of that community. Right. 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 So, you you were doing a lot of defense work. Was was being on that side of the defense um, bar. Did that sort of give you some insight into what you needed to do to prepare the case properly? Absolutely. Uh, so you, you were looking at the strengths and weaknesses of the plaintiffs that you were trying cases against. From the very beginning. From, and, and you were assessing their work and then folding that into your workflow to make you a better lawyer on the other end. Absolutely. I was told, I, I, in the first three or four years, because from my experience, so some of the defense lawyers are so traumatized by the insurance company, that they hate all plaintiff's lawyers, they hate all plaintiffs, they're all liars and everything else. And one of the better trial lawyers that uh, was maybe 10, 12 years older than me, maybe even more, his name was Joe Bars. He, he was an excellent trial lawyer, and it didn't matter what type of case, plaintiff, defendant, didn't. And, but he did mostly defense work and medical malpractice. He told me, he said, Leo, don't let these other defense lawyers tell you that there's something wrong with a plaintiff's lawyer bringing a case, a medical malpractice case. He said, you have to be on that side to understand that side. So don't turn down a case if it's got validity. And so that was my mantra all my career. I turned down a lot of medical, and you know, the plaintiff's lawyers turned down a huge number of cases that come in the door, the good ones. And they, and they take the ones that they think that they can help the client and help themselves. But when you take a plaintiff's case, when you're doing defense work, you go, you know, we got it a lot easier on the defense side. Sure, we're going to lose money, but we got, we're taking shots at them all the way and through the pretrial, through the jury trial, and that type of thing. They've got the burden, not us. And that burden actually is a burden. That burden is a burden. People who haven't tried cases don't realize that when it's, it's called a burden for a reason. It did, it, absolutely. And it, especially in medical malpractice, maybe some other, maybe products liability too, uh, which gets into the expert aspect, and that's the next step, picking the right expert, because you got to get the right expert who's going to be able to discuss the issues uh, that help the jury. Well, let's, let's talk about that. We've talked about having the client coming in the door, doing your initial work, getting an assessment worked out, really figuring out whether or not you have a case. Yes. And now you've decided you're going to file. Well, before that, I, I would have gotten all the pre-medical records, mm -hmm. if there are, and then the current ones that's subject. And this is what the client can get you without having to have a discovery order, right? Oh, we don't. It, we didn't need. All we needed was an authorization. Just an authorization. So I'd get them to sign the authorization. And what I would do... Uh, depending upon the case and, and you know, if, if I didn't know whether we're going to really go forward, if it was a local hospital, I would just go over to medical records and sit down with the file. And I would go through the file. And I'd maybe, uh, depending upon the case, but, but I'd have the history and the physical How aspect. How did you educate yourself to understand what to look for? Because, I mean, a lot of folks could read a medical file and have no idea what they're really seeing. Well, any type of personal injury lawsuit is going to involve medicine. Mm -hmm. So you gradually get, you know, you're reading emergency room for us, you're reading other charts, uh, and you just have to know where you're focused. Like if, if uh, 
you know, if it's a knee case, you're focusing on everything to do with the knee, what they did or didn't do or shouldn't do, and that type of thing. You don't, you don't care about the other stuff. You didn't, the person didn't have a heart attack, and there wasn't a stroke. And so you, did, you just focus on that portion of the anatomy or whatever type of process is going on. But what about looking at the medical record itself? I mean, did you, did you know how to, um, how to understand what you were reading? How did you develop that expertise? Uh, th through being mentored by, by uh, Demder Graham, mostly, and Larry So he'd sit with you and talk with you about <clears throat> looking at this record, what does it mean? Right. Have you seen a change since they've gone to so many digital records? Is it more difficult well, the, to sort that out now? The, the, well, it makes it easier to find the, the aspect. I think it's harder for the doctors because sometimes they're just repeating half of half of the process and it doesn't really work any, you, you know. Do you think the doctors are winding up with records that are less viable because of the digital yeah, recording? Yeah, probably, probably. Which might make it easier to cross-examine them on yeah. what appeared to be mistakes. Well, in the old days, they used, the first thing I learned was the soap entry. You would see the word soap. And so, you know, it's subjective, objective. Uh, uh, what is it? <laughs> subjective, objective. Physical. Uh, Could be analytical. Yeah, and um, it'll come to you in a minute. Yeah, assessment and assessment, and, and then uh, uh, program. Pro prognosis. Pro program. Prognosis. That assessment yeah. prognosis. So you would have that, and you would have F S. So they would write, you know, half a paragraph. The nurses. What they saw. What what they saw. Yeah, or what the person said. Or what said. that person said. Then the objective side. And that's, that's when you get into history and the physical. And that's, and that's all, all the, uh, that's, you know, that's blood pressure or whatever the, got yeah. it. And so that, that, that you learn where to go in the chart. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's actually a little bit easier now because you can read most of the charts. Uh, do you still like the malpractice work? Yeah, I do. Why? I do. Um, I'd like the medical issues on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, the, the caliber of witnesses you're dealing with uh, is on a higher level for all the, the experts for the most part. Sure. Um, but there's, you know, five, six years ago, I did a motorcycle case. <laughs> what was the most challenging aspects of doing that sort of work? The medical malpractice mm -hmm. case? Um, the most challenging part was, was I think, from the plaintiff's side, because um, you have that burden. You have this person who was injured. I mean, I never have taken a case that they weren't injured or a case that I didn't feel warranted mm -hmm. that I could get to the jury. Um, and some of the time you get to the jury, but the plaintiff just can't sell their self to the juror. So in other words, the jury's not going to believe them. The jury's not going to believe them, no matter how valid the claim is. That, that's one of my mantras, too. And, and look, I, I, I'm a lawyer. This trial is not about me. But if they don't trust my credibility as I handle themselves in their eyes in that courtroom, they're never going to even listen to the plaintiff. And if I don't have the plaintiff properly sell themselves to that jury, then they're not going to win. Because when you boil it down to the end, do they like the individual plaintiff or do they like the doctor or the health care institution? Uh, so, you know. Do you really think that it, it, it still comes down to. I still do think I it like. does. it's human nature. I mean, that's the greatest thing about our jury system. Uh, it's, it's not really a jury of your peers, uh, which people complain about. That's why we don't have professional jurors. Otherwise, you'd have doctors for doctors and that type of thing. Sure. Uh, so they don't want to be there. And... They have to like you as a lawyer. They're not going to listen to anything you say. And they have to like your client. Same thing with a defendant. So once they're there, there's only one thing they want to do, for the most part. They want to hear the facts. And they don't want to hear the lawyer. They want to hear the facts. 
So we all know what hearsay is. We all know what type of question will hurt us too. So if the question doesn't hurt you, let the other lawyer raise it. Because if you interrupt the juror's thought process, they might want to have heard that answer. So if it doesn't hurt you, let them hear it. It's that type of thing. So, um, so you're viewing everything through the lens of the jury? Yes, yes, a absolutely. I think it's one of the hardest things for young lawyers to understand that it's not about them. It's not about them. I mean, they, they're, yeah, I mean, to, to come full circle back to uh, Brian Piccolo and Gail Sayers, you, I mean, you're actually third. Mm -hmm. uh, at best, you're third. I mean, you start with, uh, start with the jury uh, and the client, mm -hmm. and then uh, maybe the judge after that, and perhaps the, the lawyers at the tail end of it. Mm -hmm. It's not about you. That's a really hard lesson to get through to young lawyers. Right, right. Uh, when did you learn that lesson? I, I knew that from watching three so you, and a half years of trial. So you knew it from seeing folks yeah. not do it in, I tr in, I in tried, the courthouse. Yeah, I tried my first jury case alone three days after I started practicing law. Were you afraid? I was terrified. Sure, but when I got into the courtroom, or the judge's chambers, they used to bring us into chambers, how you doing, Leo? When would you start? You know, and, and whew, they remember me. <laughs> so it wasn't bad. It was good. It was good. It was good. Yeah. What uh, What would you advise young lawyers who want to do this kind of work in today's environment? What would you tell them? I'd, I'd tell them to take trial advocacy. They didn't really teach that. A little bit. So you think there's you think there's value to just learning the skill for the skill's own sake? I really do because uh, the way it's taught by you and other uh, professors, uh, it's more than just winning or losing the case. There's an ethics involved in what you're doing. You have to stay within the rules, but but you have to have some clarity as to how you use all that to get your point for your client over to that jury. It's just kind of common sense. Well, common sense and the law don't always go hand in hand, do they? No. I mean, I've seen lawyers. I had a case. I was a plaintiff's lawyer, and, and it's a, it was a nice woman, second grade education, and, and she lost, um, lost a leg. She had bad diabetes. And so sued Howard Hospital, and I sued an orthotic because they put the wrong type of process in. Thing. So I sued him. So it started off the defense argument after my opening statement that the defense lawyer, during the opening thing, took his shoe off to show him what he was talking about, what the orthotic people did, and then he banged it down on the, on the part of the... Uh, on the rail of the jury? Uh, on the, the rail of the, of the, of the uh, court reporter. <laughs> it woke the judge up. <laughs> I mean, he took a recess and damn near held him in contempt. And I'm going, oh, man, I'm glad he did that. Because that jury is sitting there watching, you know, everyone else just telling them some facts and the judge saying, you know, keep an open mind and all that sort of stuff. And then you got this guy hitting the thing down. And I'm going, wow. And so... Um, you know, I knew that that was a mistake. I just, I knew. You don't do that. I mean, if you're going to do that in any part of a case, you got to do it after the jury accepts you. That, that's like, you know. you got to have credibility with them. You have to have credibility. How do you develop credibility with the jury? What, what I try and do, uh, and it's not just um, because I spit on a juror for the first round, but uh, what, what I try and do is, on the opening statement, I don't get near their space. And these courtrooms are pretty small in the District of Columbia. You don't have these wide federal courtrooms there, except in the federal court. So to me, if I'm two or three feet from eight jurors, is normally what we have, eight jurors, they're going to you know, subconsciously wonder, why is this guy in my face? Well, you know. I don't want him here. Now, toward the end of the trial, they might want him there when you want to come up and show him something, but you don't want to yell at him. You know, um, 
it, um, I don't know, a lot of it is just common sense to me. Looking back on it, um, what's the lesson? Because you were pretty practical in your approach to it from the very beginning. Is there a lesson that you wish that you had known? Uh, is, is, is there something that you wish you, you, you had understood clearly when you started practice that yeah. you only learned later? Yeah. What's that? That the plaintiff's verdicts would have expanded exponentially to the defense cost. <laughs> I would have been a plaintiff's lawyer. <laughs> But beside that. But beside that. Beside that. Um, and that's a money question, right? The, oh, that is a real money question. Yeah, I went into defense work not because I felt that plaintiff's lawyers and plaintiffs were uh, uh, lower than a whale on the bottom of the ocean. I, I went in because the defense firms were making more money and it was steady income. You get paid whether you win or lose. You might not keep the client if you keep on losing. It was that type of thing. So. Mm -hmm. Um, that, you know, that, that's just why I picked defense work. And that's why I had no hesitation uh, picking up plaintiff's work when it didn't uh, interfere with clients that we had on the other side. So. Interesting. Interesting. Well, Leo, I really appreciate you coming down and talking to us today. Yeah, it's um, my pleasure. It's, it's been most enjoyable. I, um, this has been one of those days that I, that I remember um, for a variety of really good reasons. Uh, to the folks out there who are watching this, this is part of our uh, Inside the Advocate series where we try to capture the wisdom of folks uh, who've been doing the sorts of things that we all love to do so that they can pay forward a little bit of, uh, of what was given to them. And it sounds like you had a lot of people in your life that, uh, that gave you that opportunity to be mentored and to learn from. They did. Well, we really appreciate you coming in and sharing with us today. Well, Thank my, you, Lee. My pleasure, John. Take care, brother. Okay.